Well, hello, my name is Charles Bass and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Relations here at USD. And I am grateful that you're taking the time out to watch our interview on an important topic, the state of diversity, equity, and inclusion at the University of San Diego. The mission of the USD Alumni Association is to engage and enrich the Torero community for life. Today's program is rooted in the desire to offer meaningful ways for our community to stay in touch and learn from one another. Today's interview will feature Regina Dixon Reeves, who serves as who serves the university as Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Director of the Center for Inclusion and Diversity. Dr. Dixon Reeves is a champion for diversity and inclusion, and is an accomplished scholar, author, and lecturer. She has her bachelor's degree from Marquette University, as well as master's and a PhD from the University of Chicago. Georgina, I invite you to turn on your camera and welcome to the program. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Well, it's great to have you with us today. And uh, we're just talking about uh, the state of DEI at USD. Uh, and one thing you've certainly learned at USD is that we love our acronyms. So <laughs> this is perfect. So uh, give us an overview. What's, what is happening in the space uh, at USD and uh, that you think would be of interest to alumni? Wonderful. Thank you again for inviting me into this conversation. I think there are a couple of things that we are doing here that are really exciting that alumni would be interested in. Uh, first, we, um, as you know, have launched the Horizons Project, right? And, and as part of that Horizons Project, we really are trying to do a number of things. One, become a Hispanic serving institution. Um, which we will get to just numerically about 24% of our students being Hispanic soon um, to recruit and retain and promote and graduate, right? Um, students, faculty, and staff who are more diverse, but also really being very thoughtful about sort of how we um, do the work of really enriching our campus um, so that everyone that comes here feels as if they can thrive. Everyone who comes feels as if they are welcomed and wanted. Um, everyone who comes here feels like they are a contributing member of our community. And so really being very thoughtful about how we've been doing that. And so we've done a number of things that I think that you might find really interesting. Um, we've done search committee workshops, right? Um, for all of the faculty searches that have happened in the last two years. And those workshops are really designed for persons involved in the search process, really that just talks about what are the best practices in hiring. Right? These are best practices across not only universities, but corporations, right? And really looking at sort of how do you get the most excellent people, right? And so those include things like standardizing rubrics. They include things like having um, a really interesting set of questions. They include things like making sure that your question protocol is consistent across um, candidates. It includes things like really casting a very wide net um, to get your applicants, right? And so those are the kinds of workshops that we're offering. We've also begun to do a lot of work in terms of outreach um, in terms for students. So outreach to places that we hadn't been connecting before, working with groups that we hadn't connected with before, really being thoughtful about, um, even with faculty recruitment um, and retention, how do we make sure that when we bring in groups of faculty, that they not only get sort of oriented to the university, but really get prepared to do the work to be promoted while they're here. So we've implemented new things like writing boot camps um, during the winter intercession for junior faculty. We've um, included new um, faculty uh, lecture series that allow folks to get their research out, but allow their colleagues on campus to know about their research and to potentially partner with them. And so we've done a number of initiatives like that. It really work to support the Horizons Project, but also really um, will make our environment a place that is more welcoming, inclusive, more diverse, but also more academically enriched. Um, one of the pathways of the university's Envision 2024 strategic plan, which was established in 2016 and is, is really just about to wrap up, is to lift up access and inclusion. Um, can you talk about what that means? Sure. So 
when we talk about access and inclusion, right, we're talking about access to the university. So that could be for students, it could be for faculty, it could be for staff, quite frankly, it could also be for alumni, right? So access, are there opportunities for people to engage, to really begin to interact, to be able to come to the university? Right? Um, that is something that we're really working on. Again, this whole notion of how do we, how are we recruiting and where are we recruiting from, right? Are we really tapping into the center? So I'll give you an example for, um, we know that of the student body, uh, almost half of our students come from the California West Coast area. That is indeed the case. Are we taking a look at the places, the concentrations, where of excellence um, across sort of this region in this area? Are we looking and making connections with organizations and schools that are serving diverse populations of students? Are we indeed um, doing real outreach to um, other places outside of here, right? Um, so internationally, are we looking for students across the United States? Are there centers um, where there are centers and pockets in the United States where we have not been recruiting students from, but that we could be re recruiting students from. And so really being thoughtful about that kinds of stuff, right? But beyond sort of just access or sort of entrance to a place, we really are talking about sort of inclusion. Once you get here, how do you feel as if you're welcomed? How do you feel as if you can thrive here? Um, one of the things that we know is that when young people come, in particular students, right, when they come here, oftentimes they say, wow, I am one of only a few, right? So no matter what that means, um, I'm one of only a few persons of color, for example. How do we then make sure our students, one, find community here amongst themselves, but also amongst the broader San Diego community? Right. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're saying is while we sit on this hill, you don't have to stay on this hill, right? You can find community within the San Diego community. And we encourage students to do that as well. And so really, how do we help people to find their place? The research tells us that if students find their crew, if students find their group, right, their, their tribe, if people, if you can find a connection through student organizations, through um, activities, through things that you enjoy doing. If you can find that, you're more likely to stay, you're more likely to be involved, you're more likely to continue and like you to finish. So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to make people have points of connection, have network opportunities, and also feel as if they are a real part of this university, feel as if they can contribute, that, that they matter here that care how well they do, right? And so we're doing things like making sure that when we see young people, that we're asking them, how are you doing? How are your grades look? What, what types of activities are you a part of? Have you considered joining student government, right? So we're asking students about their points of connection because we want to make sure that while they're here, they know that they are supported and cared for. Yeah, we spend so much time and effort recruiting the students. Um, we don't want to recruit anybody that is going to come here and not feel welcome and leave, right? And that's, we have to back that talk up with actions, I know, but uh, we want everybody that comes here to graduate. And I know that um, just this next uh, incoming class of first year students is, is among, is I believe the most diverse first year class we've ever had, but it's also the most academically gifted and um, among the largest, <laughs> this, I think it'll be the second largest entering class. So, so there is good work happening for sure. And um, that's the point, really important, right? That, that you just said. It is because the last um, four or five years, the, the entering classes have been more diverse each year, but these are the, la the last two years have been the most um, diverse, but they also are the most academically gifted. See, that's the thing that most people don't realize. When we're talking about excellence, right? We are talking about going after the best of the best, right? right? This is about finding the best of the best, but you cannot have excellence without diversity. You cannot have, because you don't have the best complement of, of everyone here. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that nobody can say, well, you know, if you, if you make the university more diverse, the university's rankings will drop. 
the university won't be um, academically um, as superior as it has been. Oh, no. What we have found is in the last, when you look at the, the results of sort of all of our analysis, the kids who have come in the last four years have, have done as well as anyone else. They, you know, I, I work on the student success committee. And so we take a look at how many students are doing poorly in classes and are at risk for failure. That has not increased, right? So, so what we are saying is these students are stronger academically and they are the most diverse. So that means that our classroom conversations will be much more enriched. That means that our activities and experiences in the dorm will be more enriched because we'll have access to different kinds of people. You know, but, but this is what college is about. This is what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to make sure that we have in our microcosmic world an opportunity to engage and interact with lots of different people from lots of different places so that we can learn lots of different skills that we can take outside of here to the world of work, to graduate school, and that we're prepared to do that. And that's what we're doing. Awesome. <clears throat> what, uh, what have you learned about the USD community and all your many, many interviews and uh, you know, workshops and such, um, and, and their, their um, uh, I guess, I don't wanna say interest, but their willingness to be to, to learn and grow and, and to uh, um, be active partners with you. Um, I've got to tell you that I have absolutely loved my time here at the USD. What I have found is that I've not seen, I've not come across anybody who has been completely resistant to any of this work. Um, I'd like to think that's because of the spirit of this place, right? This is the a place that has a culture of care. And, and while that sounds cliche, it, there really is that sort of ethos here. Um, and as a result, people are really interested, right? You've got this group of students um, now, and these, these young people know way more than most of us did when we were in college, right? Just about diversity, about the value of it. Um, they are hungry for it. We've got faculty who are saying, look, can you um, collaborate with the Center for Educational Excellence and do some additional um, workshops on things. We've got deans and chairs who are asking for workshops on sort of how we make sure that we are looking at sort of our faculty and making sure that our retention and promotion practices and policies are using best practices. Right? So we've got people here who are saying, man, there are some exciting things and we want to do them. Um, we actually have way more requests than we can possibly feel the need for because we just don't have the capacity to do all of the things. But I mean, regularly our office is contacted to do a tons of stuff with student groups. And we've even had um, requests from faculty, individual faculty who are saying, you know, can you come and talk to just sort of our, our faculty group? about some things. And so I've not, I've not faced any real resistance here. What I've gotten is just a group of people who are hungry because of the mission of this school, right? This is, the school has a mission for social justice. And you can't say you're really committed to social justice if you're not committed to the folks who need social justice. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. How does, um, how, does access for those with disabilities play into your work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, when we talk about diversity and inclusion and equity, right, um, oftentimes people um, believe that you're only talking about race, right? Um, but diversity really talks about race, ethnicity, uh, marital status, um, age, physical ability, mental ability, um, all of the language, right? All of these components are components of diversity. One of the things that we try to be really thoughtful about with our programming, um, one of our things that we do every month is we do something called Sweet Talks. Every year, one of our Sweet Talks is dedicated to disability awareness, disability services that are here on campus, but also connections through to the broader San Diego community. 
right? Um, we um, make sure that if we've got webinars that they are, um, the closed captioning is on, that you've got access to um, uh, transcripts so that people who need to print out and print in large print can actually access them. And so access is incredibly important for us, particularly um, for students, but also for faculty and staff. Right? One of the things that when we first started to do some work around disability awareness was the types of, um, not necessarily programming, but the types of things that faculty and staff who had levels of disability were not aware that they had access to on campus. And so really making connections for people so that um, we can make sure that everyone who's here, regardless of their ability status, can access. Because that is part of making sure that people feel like I belong here, I can connect here, and I can fully engage here. If you can't fully engage, then you can't be a, you, you won't feel as if you're a real member of our community. And so we really are trying to tear down sort of those access barriers. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to ask in a minute about some of the cool initiatives that you're working on, but I want to get this one sort of negative question out of the way. How do you react when people respond negatively to the work you are, are doing? I really have not had much negative pushback. What I have heard people say is, you know, why do I need diversity training? Why is that important? And one of the things that um, we try to say is that there are skill sets that every person should have. Um, and so those are the types of things that we are providing, right? And in providing them, we usually use real world scenarios for people to actually practice some of these skills so that they can get familiar with them. But it's never about sort of indoctrination. When we think about diversity and inclusion, right, there are two aspects of it, sort of the individual person, right? And so we encourage people to learn more about themselves, learn more about just their own biases, learn more about how they show up, where they show up, what are the triggers, things like that. But beyond sort of the individual, there's an institutional component, right? And that institutional component has to look at, you know, the complement of people, um, practices, and policies. And so that institutional component, um, you know, we are trying to make sure that institutionally, we have the right complement of people who are here. Institutionally, we're trying to look at our policies to see, are there any policies that we have that um, disenfranchise groups of people? Right? If we've got a policy, for example, that um, favors one group over another group and is not being utilized correctly, that's something that we can correct. Right? And then the practices, you know, the practices are how we do things, right? How we run a search committee. Um, if we use the best practices of how to run a search committee, then our results of our searches will be a lot better, right? And so being very thoughtful about how we do that. And so thinking about diversity and inclusion, right, really is about how do we combine both the individual and the institutional? And that, and when people understand that, I think most people say, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, ideally, <laughs> um, when they are willing to listen, that is, I suppose. But just the, you know, the enriched campus, the academic excellence, those things that, you know, folks think are going away because we're, we're trying to be um, woke <laughs> when in fact, we're not trying to be woke. We're trying to be focused on excellence, so. Well, and the focus on excellence, right, really is about, this is a social justice school, a school that's committed to that, right? We are committed um, as an institution, right, um, to the Catholic intellectual tradition, right? And those are things that I think all of our alumni, all of our faculty and students, right? I mean, that's why you've come here. And so we are just trying to enrich that tradition. Yep. And that's all we're trying to do. I love it. Well, let's let's talk about some of those uh, cool initiatives uh, I know you're working on, like the Thriving at USD workshop series. Wonderful. That is pr probably one of my favorites. It is a three-part workshop series. It allows um, us to do a couple of things. There are three skills 
that we think that every one of our community members needs to know how to listen empathetically and see and hear people the way they want to be seen and heard. Um, engage in courageous conversations by using conflict resolution techniques to, um, especially during difficult conversations that allow us to um, continue a relationship beyond the conflict. And then lastly, to learn um, bystander intervention techniques and when and where to use them so that we can keep our campus community safe. Right? And so that workshop series, we're really excited about it. It's being rolled out initially to students, but ultimately will also be rolled out to faculty and staff. Um, groups, selected groups of faculty and staff have already begun um, participating in that workshop um, training. We're rolling it out through new student orientation, through student um, groups, um, through student leaders, and just really excited because these, um, these workshops, they are a series of three 90-minute workshops, they actually um, use real world scenarios so that um, people, the participants get a chance to practice them and really get an opportunity to um, engage with them. We've gotten some phenomenal feedback um, in terms of evaluations about how it's exciting, how it was way more exciting and interesting than people thought it might be, um, which is always a great thing to hear, but also that um, people were saying, man, this, this really made me begin to think about just myself um, how I communicate, um, the types of ways that I interact with people, and it has made people really begun to just examine themselves. And that has been a really good thing, um, particularly when we do the debriefs. I'm always um, astonished at just sort of the rich um, conversations our students are having and the thoughtfulness between the different workshop topics and how they're able to link even a year apart, right? When I did the empathetic listening uh, workshop, you know, six months ago, I can still connect that with what we're doing in the courageous conversations. I can connect that to the active allyship. And so really, just really excited about that. That's great. Um, you mentioned, the, or, or we know of a couple other things like uh, departmental equity audits. And you, you mentioned earlier, that, search committee workshop. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the search committee workshops, like I said, they have been um, done for all of the faculty searches that have happened over the last few years. Really excited about that work. Um, what One of the things that we're doing is we will be expanding that to um, HR for staff um, search committees, particularly for um, uh, mid-level and senior level um, positions. And so really excited about it, that expansion with HR, but also the diversity um, equity, equity audit that we had done. All of the campus um, departments had completed an equity audit. And this equity audit really sought to do a couple of things, just record three potential ways that their department or division might become more um, inclusive, more and whatever that meant, right? And so we gave people a very broad latitude to just offer three potential things. So I worked within the Center for Inclusion and Diversity. And so one of the things that we said was, wow, this is a space that sits right in Mocker Hall, right off of sort of a main thoroughfare of either classrooms or dormitory space. One of the things that we might do is might have some really bright um, pictures on our walls because students um, often come here, they often stop through, and we wanted to make sure that the space felt more warm and welcoming. So we took a look at our environment, our physical environment. Right? One of the other things that we talked about was, you know, as we looked around the office space, we said, wow, you know, there are no males in here, right? And so are there things that we might do to make sure that as we advertise for student workers that we might attract some potentially some male students, right? So that's looking at sort of the complement of people that are here. Um, we might also take a look at some of our practices. So when you talked about uh, abilities and access, right? One of the things that we noticed was that we've had a number of meetings in our office and the way our office space was initially construed, 
if you were um, a person who utilized a wheelchair or you had um, some, we had a person come in who was on crutches. So really being thoughtful about how can we position our furniture so that people can have access to this space and feel comfortable, right? And so those are the kinds of things that we are really trying to be thoughtful of. And so we might put those things down as part of our audit. And then we collected sort of this group of, uh, of um, I'm sorry, these group of surveys from across the university. And what we have initially done is we've taken a look at them. We're looking at um, what are the types of, we're um, grouping them thematically according to the types of um, projects that people are interested in pursuing. We're um, cataloging them as either short-term, mid-range, and long-range. And then really what we'll do starting next year is we'll begin to work with and report back to the university campus the types of projects that people are engaging in. So really um, this summer, we'll be taking a look at those surveys and really begin to do a lot more analysis just to, again, see sort of what people are doing because one of the things that we like to tell people is in this office we can only do so much diversity equity inclusion those are all all of our responsibilities and so each department has a responsibility to take a look at itself and see how might i be able to um, become um, optimized and so really using this as an opportunity to provide some information to the campus about the types of projects that we can all be doing. And then we can begin to track how we're making progress. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me, one other um, initiative I wanted to ask about was curriculum audits. And so one of the things that we do, we work very collaboratively with the Center for um, Educational Excellence with Lisa Nunn. And so one of the things that we have started to pilot, and so we've done a couple audits is we've been working with groups of faculty. So faculty and deans have contacted us and said, can we do this with our faculty? And we take them through a 90 minute workshop where we take a look, at, they take a look at their own syllabi and have conversations with their colleagues about sort of how do we diversify our curriculum? How do we make it more inclusive? So doing sort of this review of, there's sort of a four step process to it, but really to take a look to see whether or not it includes things like, is it, um, can we use, um, I'm sorry, she'll have to edit that too, um, to look at things like, um, can all of my students see themselves within sort of this curriculum? Is, are my list of authors diverse? Am I offering um, curriculum that is multimodal? So, things that are in print, things that are, that are a video, things that are auditory, right? Because those are, when you talk about abilities, right? Those are the kinds of things. Um, am I, one of the things that we learned from COVID was when we all switched to virtual teaching, um, now that we're back in, on, on our campuses and in our classrooms, many of our faculty are still using some of those modalities because that is some of the best access to teaching, right? So we are having classes that are have pre-recorded lectures that offer students an opportunity to work virtually um, as part of their question and answer periods. Um, people are providing different venues so that students can access lots of different curriculums, bringing in speakers from outside of the university. Um, again, using Zoom and other features. And so there are lots of things that we're trying to make sure that people do so that indeed their curriculums are more reflective of the real world, but also reflective of the students and the world the students will be going into. Wonderful. You, um, you just mentioned that, uh, I kind of, you, you mentioned that uh, DEI is everybody's responsibility, diversity and inclusion. Um, talk about the importance of having support for your role and for the work you're doing from the president and the board of trustees. And I'm thinking particularly about the Horizon Project and the board's financial commitment to its success. Um, you cannot do this work without commitment from president, from the board of directors. It's just not possible. 
because it is not a one, two person job, right? It is literally something that everybody's got to take a look at. Um, and that's why, again, when we did sort of that equity audit, it really was about how do I work within the sphere that I am responsible for? And how do I make that more equitable, more inclusive, more diverse, right? And so those are the types of things, um, but it is, this commitment comes from the board of directors, it comes from the president, um, it comes from the provost, right? This commitment to diversity and inclusion is something that you gotta have for it to be successful. You also have to have people um, on the ground, right? So when I think about um, the things that make this such a wonderful environment, is that you've got the board and you've got the president who are indeed committed to it, but you also have deans and chairs, right, who are committed to it, but you also have staff, faculty, students who are committed, right? So you've got all of these levels where people are saying, wow, this is really important. This is important to us. And I really genuinely believe that the more programs, activities, initiatives that we do, just the, the groundswell will just continue. Awesome. Well, we have time for about one more question. And that question is, how can alumni help? You can give money. <laughs> clear you can give enough money. done we're finished <laughs> there, there are tons of things that you can give money to but also um, we need your support right we need you to um, really become actively involved in some of the program that we do we need you to mentor students there are tons of folks here who would love to connect with alumni in a meaningful way we have a ton of there. We have so many goals. You, you talked a little bit about um, just some, some of the work that we're trying to do to retain students. One of our one of the things that we love to talk about most is that our most of our students study abroad. That number is probably about 60, 65 percent. Well, there are a whole set of students who are not able to go abroad because they don't have the finances or they have families or right they've got other restrictions they're homebound and so how can we bring that abroad experience to those students and so that's going to take some level of creativity right but that also is an opportunity for our alumni to assist um, we are trying to make sure that students who that every student here has access to a meaningful internship and so alumni again can be really engaged by talking with our students by giving our students internships by making sure that our students have an opportunity to shadow them like this is incredibly important I, I think besides giving money and quite frankly giving money to diversity and inclusion types of initiatives which i have several that i'd like for you to give to right um beside that really being actively engaged with our with our people is it's incredibly important. We've got uh, veterans who are, are interested, right, in making meaningful connections with veteran-owned um, businesses. We just we just have to begin to work much more closely together. When we talk about access, again, alumni is incredibly important because we want you to know that you are part of our community, regardless of when you graduated. You are part of us. And we want to make sure that we're actively in, engaged and that it's a reciprocal relationship, that it's not just us asking for money, but that we are also providing some things as well. So we've got um, wonderful lecture programs. We'd love to have you come and just engage and, and participate in those lecture series. The Roy L. Brooks Distinguished Lecture Series is amazing. It's brand new. And so we're hoping that for the second year that'll happen next um, spring, that you'll be in, have an opportunity to come back. We've got diversity fireside chats that happen once in the fall and once in the spring. Again, those are opportunities for you to come back to campus and really be energized and, and rejuvenated based on the work that's happening here on, on campus because we, we really do want you to come back and stay involved. Well, that's fantastic. And uh, with that, we will conclude our program. It's uh, It's been great to visit with you. Uh, very special thanks to Dr. Regina Dixon-Reeves, Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at USD and the Director of the Center for Inclusion and Diversity. This program is one of many on the USD Alumni Association YouTube channel, and I invite you to check out our alumni spotlights, USD updates, 
and even our Tiny Toreros podcasts. For more information on upcoming Alumni Association programs, visit our website, which is alumni.sandiego.edu. And with that, I will say thank you once again, and thanks to everybody for watching. Go Toreros!